in everybody. Can you please confirm you can all hear me clearly? Please confirm yeah, you can, can all hear me clearly. clearly. Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me. Fantastic. Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. My name is Adiolu Adetu, and I'm a business analyst. I'll be taking us tonight on um, mastering the Gherkin syntax in business analyst um, analysis. So yes, welcome everyone to this call, and I hope you'll be as insightful and as information um, informative as possible. Um, can I just put a few house rules though? Um, as we go along, if you have any questions, can I please ask that you just make a note of the questions? I mean, you can drop it in the chat box and um, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, I mean, I can promise we'll have ample time at the end of the session to go through all your questions that you might have. So you can drop it in the chat on Zoom here. And can I please get a volunteer that will help me collate the questions as we go along, please? Can somebody please volunteer? Uh, can you show of hands, please? Just to, you know, collate all the questions. And so I'll be able to go through all the questions at the end of the session and ensure that I do not miss anyone. Do I have any volunteers, please? Should I call names? I'm going to call names. Though. <laughs> Should I call names? Um, okay. Uh, who is going to, oh, do I, so, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So you'll be, um, help me to collate all the questions, please. Thank you, though. Thank you so much for that. You can lower your hands now. Thank you. Um, yes. So mastering the Gherkin syntax in business analysis. And I know we're not all just business analysts here. We've got, we've come from um, different roles, different backgrounds, but here tonight we'll be going through what the Gherkin syntax really means. I mean, what, what it is, the relationship between the Gherkin syntax and user stories, the benefits of the Gherkin, um, key features of Gherkin, key what driven format of Gherkin, that's the format of the Gherkin syntax. Approaches to writing BDD scenarios using Gherkin. Importance of imperative and declarative BDD. Uh, examples and closer look and um, best practice. And a few brain teasers if we have time, but if we don't have time, we'll probably just go straight to um, questions and answer session in there. So what is the Gherkin? I mean, I, I know just that some of us, I want this to be as interactive as much as possible. So if you want to make any comments or just, you know, you need to say something, if you could please use the um, raising of hands icon on, on the Zoom chat, that, that would be great. And um, I will unmute you and speak. So what is the Gherkin? Gherkin originated as part of the behavior-driven development methodology. I'm sure you know this gherkin is might be new to some of people, some of us here, and some people might be quite used to what the gherkin is anyway. But we're going to go through that. You know, we'll be discussing the gherkin syntax, its uses, its roles, and importance. So, like I said earlier, what is the gherkin? The gherkin is a way of writing user stories. It's a language that we use to write acceptance criteria, which defines our user stories. So I'm assuming, you know, all, we all here, we understand what user stories are and how user stories are being written. So the Gherkin is the type of way that you should, you know, write and understand the Gherkin, um, the user stories. So one fun fact about the Gherkin. A fun fact about the Gherkin is that Gherkin is not just a term related to the Gherkin syntax in software development. It's also a type of cucumber. And I, I, you know, I've only just found this out myself. Um, it's a type of small cucumber that's been um, sometimes pickled with vinegar and is sometimes served as a snack. So that's a fun fact about the gherkin. So when people say gherkin, you know, another person is saying, saying gherkin, for instance, you know, it's not just relating to software development, it's relating to a type of food as well. So, you know, I mean, the gherkin has a dual existence in both the software world and in the culinary world. I mean, it's an interesting, this is an interesting example of a word that has different meaning, a different meaning in different contexts. So if you're among a group of cooks now, for instance, and you say gherkin, oh, they are thinking, oh, it's a kind of food, it's a kind of ingredient that I use in my food or use in my salad. But in software development, it means something absolutely different. So yeah, that's just a quick fun fact about that. So what is the gherkin? 
The gherkin is a plain text language with a specific structure used to write down scenarios and requirements in a way that is easily understood by non-technical stakeholders. I mean, we're all in this software world. We know how important it is for us to be able to translate our requirements into non-technical languages. I mean, you, you, you can meet um, a few stakeholders, for instance, and they have no idea what you're talking about. It's just that we as you know, software um, professionals are say, we, it's our duty to be able to translate whatever we're saying, the technical terms that we're saying, we should be able to, able to translate to a layman's language so that our stakeholders can have better understanding rather than just using you know, all these big words and uh, jargon words. So what is the origin of the Gherkin? The Gherkin originated as part of a BDD methodology. So BDD, like I said, I want to have questions after this. So if you can please take notes, that would be great. You know, what's the BDD? Like I said, it's a behavior-driven development methodology that was founded by, Al excuse my English here, Asilak Hellasoy. And, um, you know, it focuses on describing how software should behave from the end user's perspective. So by the time we're using, we're, we're using the Gherkin in our software, software development life cycle, we're using the Gherkin syntax to write our user stories, we should always have it in the back of our mind that this is focusing on how the software should be from the end user's perspective, not from you that you are, I mean, not from the development perspective. So that's the one thing we should bear in mind. It also describes software, I mean, like I said, it describes software as behavior from the end user's perspective. BDD is not limited to agile methodologies. It's usually associated with agile methodologies, but it's a software development approach, like I said earlier, that, 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 that describes the behavior from how the end user is going to perceive it and how they see it. So what is the role of the, of the Gherkin? Like I said, remember I said this earlier, a bridge between stakeholders. You're in a meeting, you have to, you know, pick up your stakeholders, you're a business analyst, you've gathered your requirements, and now you want to translate those requirements to user stories so they can go into sprints, so you can you know, imp initiate that project and start implementing all of the requirements that you've gathered at your initial meeting. You need to serve, yeah, as a business analyst or whoever, you need to say you're a bridge between the stakeholders, the, the people that are asking you to do something, and the um, software that you're producing at the end of the day. So the Gherkin ensures clarity. It ensures that both the stakeholders who are the non-technical people, I mean, the non-technical stakeholders, for instance, and the technical people, they understand each other's language. Any point where you're in, in the software development life cycle, you need to be able to be clear. Communication is key in, on any projects that we are, regardless of the methodology, be it to agile, be it to agile, communication is key. And the Gherkin Center helps to ensure clarity you know, you are speaking the same language. It's important that you are speaking the same language. You can just imagine, for instance, you have a stakeholder, the stakeholder is speaking French, he only understands French. And you, on the other hand, you only understand Yoruba or English, for instance. You cannot understand each other. If you are speaking Yoruba, he's speaking French. There's no how you can communicate because he doesn't understand what you're saying. You don't understand what he's saying. So if you bring that example into the context of software development life cycle, we need to we, we, we need to create a language, which is like the Gherkin was created in the first place, to create a language that ensures that communication is clear among stakeholders and ensuring that you know the software aligns with um the software that aligns with the business requirements. You know, I mean, um, it acts, Gherkin acts as a bridge between different stakeholders, not just the, the, the not just the non-technical stakeholders, it acts as a bridge between the business stakeholders, the business analysts themselves, the software testers, and the developers at the back end, ensuring that it's a common language. If I write my user stories in Gherkin syntax, my tester understands what I'm writing, my developer understands what I'm writing. I myself, as a business analyst, I understand what I'm trying to, you know, pass across to the to the technical team. So it's quite it's quite useful to ensure that there's no miscommunication at all and there's clarity of communication. It's um, also a domain specific language used for divide, def, defining and describing the behavior of software systems in a human readable and structured format. Not in um not in another format, but in a human readable format. It is particularly associated with the BDD developer. I've been saying this BDD, so please remember we'll have questions after this. So, what are the users of um you are the users of the Gherkin syntax? Of course, obviously, you have your business analysts, you have your testers, 
you have your developers, you have your stakeholders, both technical and non-technical stakeholders, you have all of that. So, you know, these are the people that use the Gherkin syntax. Uh, I mean, the Gherkin is a perfect framework for writing user stories because it gives a consistent approach for reviewing all the scenarios, for defining the definition of done and providing a crisp acceptance criteria. I mean, that's one, one important thing that Gherkin does. It's a perfect framework for rising user stories, ensuring that everybody understands it. Everybody's on the same page. Do you, they don't have to come back, oh, I don't understand what you said. Oh, can you, can you explain this? Can you explain that? Everybody has full understanding of what um, the Gherkin syntax is all about and how it should look. So next, we're looking at the relationship between the Gherkin syntax and user stories. So, um, sorry, something just came in on my. I mean, the Gherkin syntax, I mean, if you please, please, um, if you all please let me know if you are, the people are having questions or they're asking any questions, please, if you haven't just, you know, raise your hands up and let me know if you have any questions or if you, if you want me to, no questions, sorry, can I say that again? If you want me to go, we can still come back to the slides afterwards, but if you want me to go over any of the things I've said before, please do not hesitate to do that. And don't forget to drop your questions in the chat box as we go along as well. So um, the, diff the relationship between the Gherkin and user stories. So the Gherkin and user stories are related. Can I just ask this quick question in the house? How many people understand what the Gherkin is? Can I just ask this question? Do I say a show of hands, please? Do we all understand yes. what the Gherkin is? So it's not like I'm talking to myself. Yes. Do you understand what the Gherkin is? We understand yeah. what, and yes. we understand yes. what you mean. Yes. yes, and we understand what user stories are too. I'm not teaching yes. you to suck eggs, but we understand. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. So I'm not just speaking to myself. Thank you, um, Jeremiah. You have your hands up. Um, can I ask why? Can you 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 can unmute and ask, please. Is it a question that you want to ask now? Do you want me to re go go over something uh, again, or do you want I to? I think getting served as the language for writing uh certain criteria. Yes. Um, sorry, Jeremiah, is that, can you say that again, or do you want to, are you just making a it statement, please? A it serves as a language for writing acceptance criteria. Okay, yes, 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 thank you very much, thank you for that, thank you for that, so at least, I'm sure we're all on the same page, <laughs> thank you very much. So the relationship between the Gherkin and the user stories, Gherkin and user stories are quite, I mean, they're quite related, but distinct elements in the software development process. The Gherkin, like I said earlier, is a language due to write structured, human readable and executable acceptance criteria. So you can see those key information and those keywords in there. Is a language used to write structured, number one, human readable and executable acceptance criteria. So there's a certain structure to the Gherkin syntax and there's a certain flow to it whereby in that structure and in that flow, anyone that picks that thing up understand what they're trying to do and they're able to execute the acceptance criteria that is written in the form of the Gherkin. And it's often related or associated with the user story, but they're not the same thing. The, the, the relationship and the, discussion, the, the distinction. So the Gherkin is a way of writing user story, is a language for the acceptance criteria that define your user stories. So what are user stories? We all said we understand what user stories are. It's a high level feature description from a user's viewpoint. So remember we said earlier that the Gherkin is able to translate those um, translate requirements from the end user's perspective. So user stories, you're just, it, that's why it says, I mean, it's just, it's quite obvious. It's quite self-explanatory. It's a user story. I am a user. What is my story? What is my journey? from the end user's perspective. I'm a user sitting at the end of a computer. I'm trying to use the software. What is my story? So that, that's what user story is basically a high level description of the software requirements from the end user perspective or from the customer's perspective. Also user stories in the Gherkin syntax follows a particular structure. Remember I said earlier, it, it follows a particular structure. It uses templates um, like as a, I want to so that, so as a user, who is that? We are writing a user story for a particular person. Let's say you are writing a user story for an end user that wants to buy something on. Let's say you want to buy something on Next. 
Well, we want to buy something on um on Morrison's um um shop now as a user story as a customer of Morrison's. Who is that user? That's what you need to define at that point. I want to. What do you want to do? I want to buy butter. Oh, I want to buy chicken. Oh, I want to buy tomatoes on Morrison, so that I can cook jollof rice or something. That's just an example. So, what's the benefit to that user? What's the action? Was the user? Was the benefit? We'll go into full detail much later, but I just want you to start understanding. You know, so so that it starts making a, a bit more sense to us. Also, um, user stories prioritize users' needs in a simple language. Like I said, I'm a user, I'm a customer of Morrison's. I want to buy um, butter. I want to buy chicken. I want to buy tomatoes to cook jollof rice. But I don't understand what's going on the back end of the computer. I'm not the person that is going into the database. Extract. I don't know all of that. All I know is that I want to buy top chicken and I want to cook tomato. That's and I want to cook jollof rice. That's all I know. I don't know what's going on the back. So I need to be able to write it in my own simple language. I want to buy chicken so that I can cook jollof rice. So, I mean, user stories also provide a way to capture and prioritize users' needs and motivation in a simple non-technical language. And this is quite key because if you are capturing this thing in a simple non-technical language, everybody, anybody, even if it's a technical person or a non-technical person understands what is, is being, we are trying to achieve at that particular point in time. So it's a simple language. You're not writing part of it. You're not writing R. You're not writing all this, you know, jargon, not jargon languages, but like technical languages. You are writing in a simple language that everybody understands. Gherkin, on the other hand, is a language that is specifically designed for writing structured, human readable and executable specification that describes software behavior. So the key words in Gherkin is given when, then, and and or but to create step-by-step -step scenarios. You need to put that at the back of your mind, step-by-step -step scenarios. So that way it's clear. You are creating step-by-step -step scenarios. You are not jumbling everything all up. You are creating specific scenarios so that everybody understands what action is happening at step-by-step. -step. At every step in time, you understand what action should be happening. Gherkin is also used to document the acceptance criteria for user story ensuring that the feature is implemented correctly. So you are writing it in Gherkin, you are defining step-by-step -step action, and you are able to, by, do, by doing that, you are able to document the criteria for user story. And you can always, just like, you know, in the software development life, the documentation is key. You can always refer back. It's, a, it's documentation. It's something that you have written down somewhere. And you can always go back and pick, okay, if, if there's an error, there's an audit trail, you can always go back to that, that oh, what, what went through again? Didn't, didn't I capture the requirement properly? Why didn't they understand it? So it helps you by, you know, by by, by you outlining the step by step, you also understand that you also realize that, oh, I've missed a step, I need to add this in there. So it just makes sure that everything is perfect and, and properly done. I mean, the relationship, assistant criteria are, are, are specific conditions that must be met by a user story for that user story to be complete considered complete and done. The relationship between Gherkin and user story is usually that, you know, Gherkin is often used to define the acceptance criteria of a user story. Of a user story. And we all understand what acceptance criteria are now. There are specific conditions that must be met for the user stories to be, for the user story to be considered as complete and done. This criteria helps the development team to understand what needs to be implemented and serves as a basis of testing. So for instance, as a business analyst, you know, you write a user story, the development team picks it up and says, okay, this is what we need to be do. We need to do. They translate that into their, their development um, thingy. They, they implement the software. They do what you ask them to do according to the user story and according to acceptance criteria that you have defined for them at that point in time. And when it's time, oh, they come back to you, they say, oh, we've done it. Now let's put it into testing. It goes into testing. The tester still carry that getting syntax and the testers test against the user story and the acceptance criteria that you have written in the getting syntax. So every, it serves kind of like a, a, not a Bible, but a guideline for every team alongside the development team. So you have a business analyst, you've written your, getting, your story in getting systems, syntax, acceptance criteria in getting syntax, developer picks it, okay, this is what I need to do. He has written it. So it serves as a, as, a, as a template, as a visual template and a guide for each step of the way, of um, each development step of the way, if that makes any sense. I mean, and it, it, I mean, it just 
is critical that it, because it helps the development team understand what needs to be implemented and it serves as a basis for testing. I've, I've said that already. So while the Gherkin is not a way of writing your user story, it's a way of defining the specific conditions under which a user story is considered done. You know, user stories set the context and motivation while Gherkin scenarios provide detailed testable specification to ensure that the user stories are implemented correctly. So next, we're looking at the benefits of the Gherkin syntax. So what do we think are benefits of the Gherkin syntax? Um, the whoop, you are fine. Okay, you're answering some people here. <laughs> no worries, I'm just reading through the chat, sorry. So what are the benefits of the Gherkin syntax? I mean, if the benefits are quite obvious, can somebody give me an, I mean, from what I've explained so far, can somebody please give me an, uh, one benefit of the Gherkin syntax, please? Can you think of any? Because I've already said, you know, it's, ensures that if there's clarity, the, the, the user story is not considered done, or, you know, certain criteria and certain conditions are met. So, Michael, can you give me uh, a more benefit of the Gherkin syntax, please? Yeah, one of the benefits is give clear information and is make the communication smoothly. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So at least I know that I'm, I'm not just talking to myself. You guys are listening. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, the benefits of the Gherkin syntax cannot be overemphasized at any point in time in the software development life cycle. You know, it's like, like I said, it, pro it will provide sef several benefits that in such as, you know, team collaboration, enhanced team collaboration. So effective team collaboration, shared understanding. It provides a common language. A, a common language for everybody, a, common, a language that everybody, everybody in the development team understands. It provides a structure. I mean, you all know that there's nothing without structure. For instance, you want to build a house, you need to build the structure first, you need to build the foundation. The house that you want to build is going to sit on that foundation. If you don't have a proper structure, then that house is doomed to fail. So Gherkin Center enhances team collaboration and shared understanding, providing by providing a common language. You know, it, shared, it promotes shared understanding of requirements among not just testers, among the business analysts themselves, the stakeholders, the developers, and the testers. So it's fostering collaboration. Everybody has a meeting, a baseline that, okay, this Gherkin Center is our baseline. Everybody, what's the problem? Let's come back to this Gherkin Syntax and see. Another um, benefit of the Gherkin Syntax is consistent language. The language is clear, concise. Everybody understands what it is. There's no rigmaroling. It's, it's clear as day that this is what we need to do and this is what we need to achieve with this Gherkin syntax. Um, another ex, um, benefit will be, it's a basis for automation, it's a basis for testing, especially for um, people that are testers here, it's a basis for you know testing and executing tests. So um, they use the Gherkin syntax to, to create executable tests and um, automation. So um, that's another a benefit of it. Another one I wanted to talk about, um, the consistent language. The second point is it provides uniform terminology. It's a term terminology that everybody's using, simple, straightforward language. There's no, oh, I don't understand what this one means. What does this mean? Not, none of that at all. It's simple, uniform terminology, and it's a basis for automation. Um, the next one will be a, pro a benefit of the Gherkin will be clear acceptance criteria. The acceptance criteria is structured. You know, it provides a sentence criteria in a clear and systematic way. Each step, each then step, we'll go into detail into this um, in a few minutes, but each then step describes a specific expected outcome at every point in time, making it evident what this software should do under various conditions. It's also unambiguous, it's clear as day. It's also, it, 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 it's, unambiguous, it aids the development and the testing, pro and it also, testing process, and it also reduces misunderstanding and the likelihood of incomplete testing because you have written everything there. Each line, each then, the testers are testing it. Each line, they are testing everything for completion. So there's no, um, there's no issues there, you know? And it's also, you know, it's also good for documentation. It serves as a documentation for your acceptance criteria, showing that, these criteria are explicitly defined and there's a trail. It can be tracked throughout the development life cycle. And when you're moving from one stage to the other, you see that this is the Gherkin, it's clear as day. You can always, if there's an issue at any point in time, you can always retrace your steps and go back and say, okay, what happened? Where does this go wrong? This Gherkin will provide you an avenue for that. 
I mean, in some way, benefits. I mean, Gherkin is a valuable tool. He improves team collaboration, like we said, ensures consistent language, you know, provide basis for automation and, you know, clear acceptance criteria. When get, the Gherkin is used effectively, it leads to more efficient and effective software development process, resulting in high quality software projects and products. There's no rigmarole, there's no back and forth. Right from scratch, the, 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 the requirements is clearly defined. Everybody knows what they're working on. And you go and you are moving, you know, you are moving through that project methodically. There's no, oh, I don't understand, go back, come back, and all of that. None of that is there. We are moving, it's, it's quite methodical. So that's, it's, it's a quite um, a good benefit of the Gherkin syntax. So what are the key features of the Gherkin syntax? Remember, this is where you need to take notes because obviously as business analysts, as testers, we're going to be writing the Gherkin syntax. We're going to be using this in our, in our, in our, um, in our work. So we need to pay, pay attention to this. What are the key features of the Gherkin syntax? It's structured format. It's the spe it, it, it specifically organized in a way that it describes a feature or, the, or functionalities. This description consists of scenarios that outline how the software should be in. I've said that already over and over again. Yeah, allows how, outlines how the software behaves under specific conditions. Um, keywords in Gherkin. I mean, keywords in Gherkin, we'll come to that too, you know, in Gherkin syntax, um, it uses specific keywords to define the intent of each scenario. So some keywords that we use in Gherkin syntax are, you know, the feature, given when, then, but we'll come to, we'll come to that in detail much later. Also, the Gherkin is designed to be human readable. It's designed to be human readable and easily understood by individuals that might not be from technical backgrounds. It encourages clear and concise language to describe software behavior. I know you, I know you guys might have worked with developers before, and sometimes when they're using all these big, big words, you're like, hey, what are they saying? Oh, help me. But with this decking thing that everybody's clear, on the project, everybody's clear. We know what we're talking about. Also, um, the Gherkin syntax is executable. When it comes, to, I mean, the testers understand what I'm talking about when I say executable here. It can be is associated with automation codes, um, allowing for you know those scenarios to be properly executed and properly tested. Yes, when obviously when the tester gets gets their test right and they've tested all of these steps, it ensures that the software behaves the way that it has been specified in the Gherkin description. Uh, another feature of the Gherkin syntax is collaboration. I mean, I cannot overemphasize that. Um, it promotes collaboration between all stakeholders, not just business analysts, you know, the product owners, the, um, the, the business analysts develop, even the product owners, when they pick up this, they pick up the, you know, non-technical stakeholders, let's say the director, for instance, when they pick it up, they understand it's as clear as it is in plain English language. So there's no, they understand, they can see that, okay, this is what we're trying to achieve at this point in time. You know, it also provides a common language for discussing and documenting requirements. It en enables the team to create living documentation. So documentation is key in any process in, within the software development lifecycle. It encourages people, teams, to create living documentation that remains up to date with the software's behavior. And it encourages a shared understanding um, of requirements and helping to verify those requirements through automated testing. So yeah, that's the um yeah, I I'm just looking if you have any comments. Um, you know, please keep an eye on the comments and let me know if anything. But yeah, that is so far. So next we'll be going. So next we'll be going to um the keyword-driven format in Gherkin. Yeah. The keyword-driven format in Gherkin. So I would like you to pay close attention here because this is quite important. So keyword driven format in Gherkin, like I said earlier, Gherkin is a plain language used to develop the and used to explain the behavior driven, driven used in behavior driven development, and it follows a structured format with keywords that help define and organize features, scenarios, and their steps. So here are some of the keywords used in Gherkin. So the first, the feature. I'm sure you guys have started your project already, and you know, you know, on your job board, you are creating your features, your um, epics, and all of that. So the feature. What is the feature? The feature describes 
the high level functionality being tested. That's just it in plain English word. What is the future? It describes high level exam um, high level functionality being tested. So the future, let's say, I know we use this all the time, but let's say, oh, I didn't realize, okay, yeah. Let's say login, for instance. So login feature, what do you want? What do you want to achieve on that login? What do you want to achieve on that signing panel all of that? Um, login functionality, for instance, as a user, I want to be able to log in so that, so what is that? The feature is the login functionality. What's the top level? I'm sure you've got epic, features and user stories and how that cascades down from one level to the other within your, within your whether it's Azure board or whether it's Jira, whatever software you're using. I'm sure you've done that or you will do that soon in the future and see how that cascades down. So um, that's what the feature does, describes the high level functionality being tested. Next you have, um, Apologies. <laughs> so um, the next is the scenario. So the scenario describes um, a specific instant or a specific scenario within the feature. You know, describe the specific scenario within the feature. So uh, let's say, for instance, we used login functionality. So the next scenario, let's say, for instance, we say, oh, valid user, um, valid user logon. You know, or something like that. Just something that another step after that feature that you've already, um, you've already identified at the at that point in time. So next, you have the given. Now, this is where it's quite important. So this is for your user story, your acceptance criteria. So given, what is given? Given is the word used to describe the initial context. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay, so it's used to describe the initial context or the precondition. It sets the stage by defining the precondition or the initial stage. You know, so let's say we're talking about login page now. Let's say giving the user. So what is the precondition before the user can log in? There's a certain condition that there's a certain condition that that process has to has to um, define. So before the user can log in, it has to be on. The landing page, for instance, if it's not on the landing page, it cannot. If I want to buy something on Morrison's, and I'm on a, a next website, for instance, will I be able to log into Morrison's? Absolutely not. So there's a condition I need to fulfill as a user before I'm able to buy something on the Morrison's website. Before I'm able to buy my chicken and I'm able to buy my butter. Do you understand? So now. I go onto the Morrison website because that's where I want to buy something. There are certain things that you need to do. If you want to drive a car, for instance, you need to first carry your body and put it inside the car and put it in front of the steering wheel. You can't sit in your parlor and say, oh, I'll be driving my car. No, there's a certain condition that you need to, you, you, you need to achieve before you are able to drive the car. So that's what the giving is such the initial context. Next is the when. So the when describes the action or the event that occurs after the precondition. So you, you have satisfied one condition. Is um, the when is the key word that triggers the action. It represents a specific action that needs to be performed. After I fulfill that precondition, the when is that action that, so I've done, let's say I've, I've played my part now. I've gotten into the car. I've turned the steering wheel. I've, I've started the, 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 I've started the car. I, once I click, press on the accelerator, the car needs to move. So that's the action. That's the action that I'm telling to the other side. Um, remember, I'm a user. I'm just sat in front of a computer. I'm pressing something in. Once I do initiate my part, then something needs to occur at the back end. And that thing needs to provide a result for me at the front end again. So it's kind of like a give or take. I do something. It's a precondition. The system does something and returns a result to me. So that's what the when describes, the action or the event that that should occur once the precondition has been satisfied. So the next is then describes, the then describes the expected outcome. Remember I'm using that car analogy. I, I want to drive to somewhere. I want to drive to the supermarket, for instance. I get in the car, I sit down, use my seatbelt, turn on the ignition. I press on the accelerator. I don't know what's happening in the engine. I don't know. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not an engineer. I don't know. I just know that once I press the accelerator, I, I expect that car to move forward. 
If I press the accelerator and that car doesn't move, I know that there's a problem somewhere. And that, 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 that um, is not giving me what I want to. So now I press the accelerator, it moves. How it's moving at the back end is not my business. It moves, it takes me to the supermarket that I want to go and I get out of the car. That's my, that's my, result. That's my expected outcome. So one that then is describing the expected outcome. The then is describing the car working, the car doing what it's supposed to do because I have satisfied a precondition, if that makes any sense. You know, um, it's the, the 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 then keyword is used to specify the expected outcome after the action described in the when has taken place. It represents the expected end state of the scenario. Another one, which is I mean, this is arguable, but and and is um, sorry, not arguable. Excuse me. So another um, another keyword format in Gherkin is the and. So this is to describe additional steps that provides more detail within the given when then scenarios. We're going to go into detail um, a, a, a little bit further, but you know the and rather than saying in a user story, you know, given when then, in a user story, sometimes you have different lines. It's not just given. And you have not just one given, you have one given, two given, three, you, you can have multiple. So instead of using giving, 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 which is repetitive and can sometimes be a bit confusing, you can use and to replace any of this. So you can use and instead of saying giving, giving, you can say giving and when and then. It's just used to describe the additional steps to provide more details to, to each, each, each of within the giving when then section. So let's say giving I am a user. Of, or I'm, I'm on that landing page. Let's go back to that landing page analogy I used earlier. Given I'm a user and I am on the landing page. So given I'm a user, normally you would have said, oh, given I'm a user, given I'm on the landing page, given I press, uh, I click on login, rather than saying given, 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 you'll say given I'm a user and I am on the landing page and I press on login. That way it makes more logical sense and it makes more logical flow rather than say, using the same giving, giving, giving all over again. And then the when, just like I did with the giving, the when to, instead of saying when, when, when I click on the landing page and I, I'm taken to the sign up page, and uh, when I'm, I'm taken to the page, when I click on, land, uh, on the sign up page, when I'm taken to, instead of saying when, when, when all the time, you just use that when once and say, and I am taking to the landing page. And so it's describing more detail and providing more detail to each of the steps above, um, if that makes any sense. So uh, let's go to the next one that approaches to writing uh, BDD scenarios. So approaches to writing BDD scenarios are two different approaches. There's the imperative approach. So imperative and declarative, there are two different approaches to writing the Gherkin scenarios, which are used in the behavioral driven development. I've been saying this behavior driven, please take notes so that when we ask questions eventually, you will be able to answer. Um, let's explore the differences between the two and provide examples for a login. So I'm doing a login scenario on one of the projects that I've worked on before. It's an, um, you know, an educational video website and I'm using this as an example. So the imperative, what is imperative? In imperative, the focus is on describing the step-by-step -step action a user takes to achieve a particular outcome. It specifies the exact sequence of actions that the user should perform. So the imperative one is defining step-by-step -step actions. It's used to provide detailed instructions about the functionality. It focuses on the how. So there are different scenarios where you can use these two different um, approaches to writing Gherkin system within the BDD scenario. So when do you use imperative? Imperative is when you want to provide explicit, I mean, it depends on your team and it depends on where you find yourself while you're working at the end of the day. Because some people will say, oh, I prefer imperative. Some people say, I prefer declarative. It depends on whatever whatever your personal preference is. But you need to understand when it's using that, when it's best to use it. So when do we use imperative? It's often used when you want to provide explicit details and instructions about how a feature of functionality should work. It's useful when you need to provide specific steps you know, specific step, steps to follow. Declarative, on the other hand, focuses on describing the desired outcome. So you can see the difference. So declarative, um, declarative focuses on the desired outcome, what? Imperative focuses on the actions, how? You know, it's focusing on the desired outcome without specifying 
detailed step, unlike in primitive, without specifying detailed step, it, it just allows for more abstract, high-level description of what should happen. So if it's a high-level thing, you want this is one user story, you want to say, bye, 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 you are done with declarative. But in primitive, you want to, you know, write it in detail, step by step, this is what to use. When do we use declarative? Declarative is usually used when you want to emphasize the behavior or the end results rather than the specific interactions. So for instance, I'll give you examples for that. But for instance, declarative, and given I'm on the landing page and I click on login and I'm signed, I'm, I want to be signed in successfully, that is move, you have moved on rather than giving the specific, oh, when I'm on the landing page and I click on login and I click on this one. So it's useful for scenarios where the how is not as important as the what. But on the other side, imperative is useful for scenarios where the how is just as important as the what. You know, in the imperative example, each step is explicitly defined, outlining their, excuse me, outline the exact outcome that um, the exact end result, for instance. So the choice really depends on you as the person that is writing the user story. And it depends on the level of detail or the level of abstraction that is needed for the particular scenario. So imperative um, Gherkin, uh, scenarios are more suitable when you want to provide clear step-by-step -step instructions, while declarative is suitable when you want to emphasize on the overall behavior. So what are the importance of using imperative and declarative BDD? Imperative, what's the importance? You know, imperative, you can reuse it. You have already written everything step by step. You have written over more than uh, more than you know more, more than enough. So what's, what was the importance of that? The declarative is reusable. It's you can control it. It's flexible and it's easily integrated with um, code. So that's for um, the imperative. The importance of using the imperative gherkin. <clears throat> you know, it's um, it allows you for more detailed fine grained control over the test implementation. Reusability, you can use it more for multiple scenarios and you can just, it, it promotes efficient um, test case management and minimizes redundancy. Then integration with code, imperative Gherkin is of, often used when tightly integrating with the actual test code. On the other hand, you have the declarative. What are the importance of using the declarative instead? Instead, excuse me, it gives clarity and readability. It focuses on describing the expected behavior of the system in the human readable natural language format, like giving me, you know, meta collaboration and um, live documentation. So that's the importance of that. So now we're going to go into example of user stories, which is I'm sure we've all been waiting for. So this, uh, I'm not sure, this is not quite clear, but these are examples of user stories that I have written on, um, well, that one of the business analysts on my team wrote for um, a particular project that I was working on, uh, working on at that point, point in time. So you can see this one at the front here. You can see, you know, this is the description. This is the scenario right, um, right here. As a user of the website, I want to be able to sign up so that I can create an account and have access to the resources. So you can see all of these ones there. You can see the different scenarios. You can see the different scenarios on there. And um, we'll be looking at the user stories in more detail in the, in the next slide. So closer look. Now, remember, this is where all these things begin to marry together, all the things that I've said earlier. So you have your feature, you have your scenario, you have your Gherkin Center, your feature. So what is the feature for this particular user story that we're looking at? Remember that user story that I showed you earlier? So we're looking at it closer and we're looking at the feature called user registration. User registration, that's a um, basic topic. This We want the user to be able to register on the website and sign up on the website. So this is my <clears throat> scenario. So as a user of the Retube website, I want to sign up for an account so that I can access educational videos and resources. So you can already see those steps as a, I want to, so that I, that is quite important, which is why I put it in bold, you know, and um, it includes step-by-step you know, navigation of what the, the 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 software should do. So this is the scenario now. User signs up successfully. 
Let's go through that scenario. Given I am on the landing page of the website and I click on the sign up button and I am on the sign up button and um, page, when I enter my email address and I enter my full name and I set and I confirm and I agree and I click, then I should receive a confirmation email and I should see that I have been successfully signed up. So you can see how this example plays out. You know, in this example, each step is explicitly defined to guide the user registration process, including filling out the form, agreeing to terms and conditions. Um, you know, this is imperative with detailed technical instruction. You can see what I've done here. So this is my given. Given I'm on the landing page of the Retrievers and I click on the sign up button. So this is still a precondition. Remember, your given is a precondition. Your when is your action and your then is a result. Always remember that. Given your precondition, when is your action, then is your result. So given I'm on the landing page. And so look at what I've done here. Instead of saying, given I'm on the landing page and given I click on the sign up and given I am on the, rather than saying given, you know, that tautology, repeating it over and over again. I just say given I am and I click on, and I am on black. when. So this is where the scenario changes now. This is now going from my precondition to my action. When I enter my email address and I enter my full name. So this is also an action as well. And I set the password and I confirm. And, and you can see the, all of this. And look at this and here. One, two, three, four, five. All of these ands are still action that are related to the when. But instead of me using the when over and over again, I'm using the and here so that to ensure clarity and to ensure that there's no unnecessary repetition. Then you can see right now, I have my results. Then I should receive and. So this and uh, is also referring to then. So when you're in your scenario, when you're writing your graph, you need to remember that you cannot just put the and here and then. Whatever and that you put relates to the precondition before it. So this two ads here is relating to this given, which is a precondition. And when, so that, that step has already changed here into an action. And one, two, three, four, five is relating to the when. And all of these are actions, as you can see from here. Then, then that already changes here to a result. Then is a result, is the expected outcome I'm, I'm expecting to see. And this and relates to the then. So any and that follows the given when then relates to the, to the, Keyword that is before it, if that makes any sense, you know. So that's it on the imperative one. And oh, I didn't even realize I had one more. And okay, so you can see I have I even have three more there. So and 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 these three relates to the and, which is the expected result. So look at let's look at the um declarative example now. So closer look at the declarative. In this declarative example, the emphasis is on the desired outcome. High level steps, high, you know, focuses on the end results, not the de detailed steps. This approach is business oriented and it provides clarity on expected behavior without specifying every step. So you can see the first three, um, the same feature like we looked at earlier. As a user, I want to sign up so that I can access um, educational resources. And now look at, this is where it begins to change. Now look at the scenario. User signs up successfully, that's fine. So look at this, given I am on the sign up page of the YouTube website, when I initiate the sign up process, then I should be able to, I should be registered successfully with my email address and full name. And I should be able to be registered with my password and all of that. So you can see that this one is simple, direct, straightforward. I'm going to ask you which guy, which you guys prefer at the end of the, the session, but it's simple, direct, straightforward, given when then. End of story. There's no um, wasting of time. There's no because obviously it's, it's just um, a, 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 a sense sense check really because given you're on the signing page or sign up page of the website, you're on the sign up page. They don't need to tell you that you have to click on sign up button. You're already there. You know what to do. So this one is not specifying detail steps. It's just showing you the, what, what I want to be able to do. What is my expected outcome at the end of the day? So and you can see that. Well, this and this three and one two three it relates to the expected outcome, which is the then. If that makes any sense, and I should be able to access, and I should be registered, and I should receive a confirmation in is the expected outcome and the expected result that we want at the end of the day. So, what are the best practice? A quick best practice for the Gherkin syntax: start with giving when and then. So it goes in that structure. You can't start with then. Just like I said, you want to drive a car. You can't just, you cannot just enter the car 
and the car will start driving you to Morrison's, unless the Tesla is going to release a car in a car like that in the next few years. Who knows? But there's certain precondition that you need to go. You need to get into the car, wear your seatbelts, start the ignition, click on the accelerator, press on the accelerator before the car goes. So you start in that sequence. You start with the precondition, you go on to the action, which is then, uh, which is when, sorry, and then you go on to the expected result, which is then. <clears throat> so use and and both, but use it sparingly. Of course, this is easier to achieve with the um, imperative rather than the, with, with the um, result-oriented one rather than the step-by-step -step one. But we need to ensure that we use this sparingly. We need to be able to um, stay consistent. You know, by following these best practices, you can leverage the Gherkin syntax effectively to document and communicate your requirements in a clear, structured manner, ensuring that all your stakeholders have a shared understanding of the software behavior. So, you know, use, it's just, you know, begin is just, just like I said, use and and but, but use it sparingly. Avoid excessive use as it can make the scenarios hard to follow. Stay consistent, maintain consistent terminology and style throughout your, your files. Consistency is crucial for readability and understability, understandability, sorry. So keep it readable. This is, the Gherkin is designed to be human readable. You know, keep it readable as much as possible. Avoid using, overusing technical jargons. Focus on what the user sees and experience. Always have it at the back of your mind that this is the user. Like they said, customer is always right. Always put yourself in the position of that customer so that you are being able to translate the customer journey effectively. And then use them um, business language. Use languages that stakeholders, not jargon, not technical terms, but languages that stakeholders can understand. Avoid technical terms or languages that might be confusing to non-technical stakeholders. <clears throat> then use descriptive feature names. Remember that that's my previous slide. Where is it? Descriptive feature name. Look at my feature name. User registration is clear as the user to be able to sign up. There's no there's no font that, um, there's no confusion in that. So you need to be able to use descriptive um future names to ensure understandability and clarity for everybody on the um on the team for all the stakeholders on the team and write clear and specific scenarios clear and specific scenarios concise focusing on one aspect of the future not jumbling all different aspects together on what you can write as many user stories as you, as you want nobody's stopping there's no uh, there's no there, there's no but um, um to how many user stories you can write. So, you know, be able to use focusing on one aspect at the time so you ensure clarity. And even the development in the development team, they're, able, they're going to be able to deliver it uh, as possible. So use concrete examples to illustrate expected behavior. And then, um, <clears throat> so, yes. So we have come to our knowledge test here. And I know I said um, we're going to, I'm going to take your questions after this, but let's just do a quick knowledge test. So <clears throat> this is the scenario. A user, store, a user wants to log into an educational video website. Um, please write the Gherkin syntax. In, write the Gherkin syntax, given when then for this scenario. Um, Adebayo Babalola, do you want to have a go, please? <clears throat> you can unmute yourself yeah. and speak if you want to have, have a go. I have a question, please. OK. Have you put your questions in the chat box, please? Mm. Okay, okay. Not yet. Okay, so yeah, ask, yeah, ask. What is your question, please? Hello? Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Uh, okay. I can see with uh, your explanation now, looking at the benefits of the GAKIN and the relationship between GAKIN and user story. Now, I want to ask, is there any specific project that GAKIN would be preferable to be used than using the user stories? Is there any critical so, project? So I'll take, I, 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 I think there's a confusion here. So I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take other questions, but let me just quickly say that. So the GAKIN is a way of writing the user story. It's a way of defining your acceptance criteria. If you go back to, if you, we go back to the scenario that I showed you earlier. So this is my user story right here. This is my user story right here. This is my user story right here. But I've written my user story using the Gherkin syntax. 
you can see I've used the given, which is my precondition, the when, which is an action word, and the then, which is the expected result. So the Gherkin is a way, remember I said initially, the Gherkin is a way, is a, is a way within the BDD that you used to write your user story. So it's a, it's, it, it's a way that you used to write your user story in a clear, concise manner so that everybody on the team understands what you're trying to achieve. So the Gherkin is not different from the user story. It's a way of ensuring that your acceptance criteria, which is all of this, is clear as day from the initial point. So it's, they are not two different things. You still have your hands up, but let me quickly go through this, um, this thing and then I'll come back to your question. Um, Adebayo, if you have a minute. Do you have, can I please ask, do you guys have uh, anything? You have something for nine o'clock, right? No. No, okay. Okay, that's fine then. So we'll take your question. Um, you know, if you can please note his question down, we'll come back to that after the, after this. So I was doing the knowledge test. Um, I said a user wants to log into an educational video website. Video website. Can somebody please give me the getting steps? The given when then for this scenario. Does anybody want to have a go, please? Any takers? Come on, you guys are forty five on this call, please. Somebody should just tell me I've not been talking to myself for the past fifty seven minutes. Hey guys, please. I'll start calling names. <laughs> Does anybody want to have a go? Hmm? Please, this is a memory. It's not, I'm not, I'm okay, I'll, I'll try. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you please? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Given I'm um, on the landing page of the educational video website. And I enter my details. Sorry, when I enter my details, uh, my sign-in details, I sh then I click sign in. I should be able to. Oh, sorry. I think I'm doing the I'm doing the user story. Sorry, one minute. No, no, no. It's, that's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> okay. Given I'm on the landing page of the uh, video website, when I enter my sign-in details and I click on the sign-in button, then I should be able to access the web, the web, the videos on the website. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's fair enough. Yes, you had a good try there. Thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, as you keep writing user stories, you would, um, as you keep writing user stories, you would, I mean, as you get more experience writing user stories, you see that this is quite, it's quite simple and straightforward, but that, that was a fantastic try. Thank you very much. So just like, I mean, this is just, is, is this knowledge check is the same example of this user story that I, I used right here because I'm using a project that is quite close to my heart, which is one of the projects that I just finished working on. So, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing, just, you know, the, the user wants to log in, what are the things? So it's the same steps that I have defined here. Sorry, I click, click in, clicking back and forth. I just wanted to show you um, the user story again. So thank you very much for that, Izu. Thank you. That was a very good, um, uh, fantastic answer. Thank you very much. So it's just, you know, using the giving when then, you knowing, knowing when you should use it. So look at what I've done now. This is the answer. User logs in successfully. That's the scenario. Given I am on the landing page. So this is my user story. And that's for you, Adibayo, when, because of that question that you were asking. That is it. Every, user story is a user story. Your Gherkin is just a method or a way in which you used to write your user story and your acceptance criteria. It's a structured method. It's something, it's kind of like, uh, let me put it this way. I think it's kind of like a template. It's like a template for writing your user story, a, 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 an easy template for you to follow. So that way, when you want to write your user story, you don't even have to think too far. You know that you start with as a, I want to so that, and you go to giving when then. The structure is that the template is that you just need to follow it. That makes any sense. So given I'm on the landing page and I click on the login button. So I'm using the imperative right here, which is the descriptive one. And I'm on the login page and all of that. So this is just, you know, um, a, 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 a um, what's it called? This is just the answer to that um, that I gave you. 
So this is a question now I have for everybody. In the Gherkin syntax, the word given is used to establish what? Who wants to have a go at that? Do we know what, do you remember what the word given is? It's to establish what, please? Do we want to have a go? No? Okay. Giving, yes, Precondition. Yes. Yes. The given actually explains the scenario. Yes, thank you very much. So that's a precondition of the context. So the next question would be in Gherkin syntax, the word and is used for what? Remember the and that we use is used for additional step that provide more details. Addition, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Additional context. Additional context. So what is the difference? Yes, that this is for you, Adebayo. So what is the difference between the Gherkin and user story? I'll just answer that one. User story is a high-level description of requirements from the end user's perspective. While the Gherkin is a language for your acceptance criteria, which defines your user story. Do you understand? It typically follows a template like as a I want to so that user stories provide a way to capture and prioritize user needs and motivation in simple non-technical language. Gherkin is a language specifically designed for writing. <clears throat> Structure human readable um, executions, which uses keywords like given when them. Do you understand? So I hope this answers your question. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, summary. You know, Gherkin is a powerful tool for capturing and communicating requirements. Um, you know, following best practice that I have said earlier before and avoiding mistakes enhances its uses and effectiveness. So, questions we only have two minutes. I apologize. We only have one minute for questions. So, um, Idowu, can you give me the first question, please, so I can answer that quickly and we can wrap up. Do we have the questions now, Idowu, please? No question. Idowu, are you no there? question. The only question. question yeah, Chibaka, do you have a question? Can you answer, uh, ask quickly, uh -huh. please? Okay, yes, thank you, uh, Adeolu. Thank you very much. Please, my question is, um, um, actually, we've been writing some user stories over uh, the course, and we've been writing user stories, give acceptance criteria and additional information. Yes. So I just want to yes. ask, the criteria we've been using, we've been writing all this while, is it an example of this Gherkin syntax that we've been writing <laughs> under the normal user story, or is it, I don't know. I don't yes, know if you get my. A, yes, it is an example of this Gherkin. So you have been writing that user story. You've you've written your scenario. You've written you are writing your acceptance criteria with the given when then, right? That's what you are doing, isn't it? So what that given when then is yes, yeah, is that's a, that's an example of the Gherkin. But you need to remember that each of those keywords you need to be able to use them appropriately. So when you are writing your user stories, now when you are writing given, you understand that the given is a precondition, and you understand that after writing that first line that has given, if you want to add any other thing, you can put and given and 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 then the next is your when, which is your action word, which is you know the action that you want to be performed by the by the software after you have satisfied the precondition. And then the then is the expected results. So yes, you are quite right. You have been writing it in the Gherkin syntax, but now with this knowledge that you have that we've just shared tonight, you'll be able to, you know, you have more clarity when it comes to writing those user stories and understanding how you are even putting. So now, even before you send it, you, you put those user stories into sprints, you understand what you're trying to achieve. You have clarity that, okay, when are you are even reading it yourself, you know that, oh, this is what I'm trying to achieve. And when the developers pick it, they understand that, oh, this is what they want to achieve under this particular scenario. So yeah, hope that answers your question. And yes, thank you very much, everyone. I'm five minutes over time, I'll have one minute more, but yeah, thank you very much. I hope it's been it's been insight, um, insightful and it's been clear enough for everyone. And yes, if you have any questions, please, um, I think you can, yeah, I think I admin mean, will let you know who to contact, but thank you very much for being in this session and that will be all for tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time as well.